Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Austin from Austin B Media. I'm here today with Sarah Watts and Mark uh, Slutsky, um, the directors of You Can Live Forever. It's a film uh, screening out of Tribeca. It's about a uh, queer teenager named Jamie um, who goes to live with her parents, uh, well, not parents, sorry, aunt and uncle uh, during the 1990s after the death of her father. And you know what? That's all I'll give people to go on so that they can discover this from themselves. You can watch it um, June 11th at the uh, Angelica, um, June 12th at the Angelica, um, or at home on June 13th. Um, I and, think uh, you can June get in June 14th as well. There's uh, also June 14th, a uh, third in-person screening. Yeah. Yeah, June 14th as well. Um, you can get individual tickets for, I believe, $26. And then I believe at home is 13 or something of similar of that nature. Actually, no, sorry, 15. But um, Sarah, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I saw the film a couple days ago. I really ap appreciated the opportunity to cover this film um, as I do tend to go out of my comfort zone with um, films from festivals um, just because I'm like, okay, what else is out there other than what I usually watch? And I was actually pleasantly, I, I loved this story. Um, there's a lot of, that's the score by CFCF is fantastic. Um, it's everything a nineties kid like me needs. Um, <laughs> I, I especially felt the trauma of uh, her dropping the, uh, I believe it was a tape player uh, in the uh, lake or ocean or whatever that was. I was like, oh no, you can't get that back. You can't just go to the Apple store or get that back. Um, but speaking about the story, um, Mark, this can be for either one of you. What made you think of this story? Um, well, I grew up in that, in the Jehovah's Witness, in the Jehovah's Witness community. So we sort of just went from there because it's sort of an interesting place to start from. Not too many movies or TV shows even really delve into that community. So yeah, that's sort of where we start from and then we just grew it out of there. Yeah, you know, uh, Sarah was describing her upbringing and the kind of world she lived in. I thought it was so fascinating and uh, the types of characters and the locations and the, their, their sort of rituals were so interesting to me. And it's so interesting to me how she could have navigated that uh, as a gay teenager, um, that the story really came out of that. Uh, and we both also sort of grew up, we were the same age, we grew up in that era. We both broke in our share of Walkmans uh, <laughs> or, or headphones, you know, like, like all that, all those details are, you know, details from growing up in the 90s. And uh, weirdly, even though I had really, you know, a lot of very different experiences from Sarah, there were a lot of similarities of being like, a teenager during that time feeling like a bit of an outcast um and and i wanted to for us to sort of really dive into all the details of our lives and all the little things that we remembered that we we thought could tell an interesting story and a compelling story because um because we just hadn't seen it on screen before yeah and i watching it i had wondered okay there's got to be something personal to it because um i was like there's just certain questions that um, that people ask, I'm like, that's coming from experience of having a having somebody ask you, um, what is this like? What is this like? Um, or a conversation that I'm trying not to spoil some of the stuff, um, <laughs> so I'm dancing around it. Um, but yeah, just certain questions um, were fascinating because it felt authentic. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's a bit of an overused word these days, but I, I did feel like that was really well weaved into the plot. It, uh, it could have well, it could have just as well just been another element, but it felt like, no, this is really part of what this movie is, what her, what the conflict is, and it just everything really. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of that, um, 
the um, let's see. Um, there, there's an interesting way that this dialogue is delivered in this film that I found so fascinating. And maybe it's a perception thing, but it's the dialogue's almost delivered in sort of a monotone way that with almost um, no inflection to just kind of not give away um, the emotions behind it. So I, I'm, I was wondering um, what what drove that decision if it is a decision and not I, my perception i mean i think that teenagers talk like that <laughs> <laughs> i don't think I, I we really wanted to like um create authentic as you said don't reuse but in this case a good word the way that teenagers talk to each other i think a lot of um screenwriting can sometimes give away that it's adults writing these lines and <laughs> yeah and we really wanted to shy away from that. It makes it feel like like the world is more lived in if kids talk like kids. And kids- You know, it, every teenager has something they're hiding, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. these teenagers like definitely have something they're hiding, but I think every teenager is hiding something, whether it's an insecurity or something in their past or, you know, something they're scared of, afraid of or someone they're in love with. And, you know, I think a lot of the dance that the characters do in this film is gradually revealing themselves and revealing their vulnerabilities and, um, they're just not going to do that, like, you know, when they first meet each other. It's, it, it, you know, we really wanted to, like, uh, really see that play out and see that transformation into openness and vulnerability and uh, crossing in the lines into doing things that they might have found scary or ne never imagined themselves doing, like, you know, uh, Jamie. I, I don't want to give away anything, but, like, you know, yeah, uh, we wanted these characters to go places that they did not realize that they were going to go. And I think... Um, if they completely knew, you know, knew themselves in that sort of like uh, very uh, declarative way from the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think they, that they would have a journey to take. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. I know that was about 14 cents no, to staple together. It, it does, especially considering uh, a shift, which I'm trying not to spoil, that happens in the film a few times. <laughs> um, between characters all all I'll say is that there's this interesting perspective shift about halfway i think in um it, it because i do think it i think one of the highlights of this film is it tries to um it it tries to highlight the um d difference in perspectives i'll say um I'll say it that way because um, you've got one side coming at it like, no, we're just trying to be, this is the way we know this new system. I'll say about that. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it's interesting um, because of that shift. You, it could have very well have been just a, no, this is right, this is wrong. And there's no in between, but the film is filled with, no, there is an in-between, there's degrees, there's multitudes to this, which I found fascinating. Um, and um, so, I, I, so this is your debut film. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I wanna ask, you know, I, I don't get a lot of co-directors come on here uh, to, to, to interview, so I've gotta ask, what what was it like, you know, working together throughout the entire process directing this film? Um, it was kind of, we also wrote it together. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that too. this this was a unified creative vision from the start. Um, you know, particularly because it, it draws so much on Sarah's own background. Uh, originally, we had a more conventional, oh, we'll write it together, and Mark will direct it. But at some point, we realized that this was just a, a joint. Uh, creative project and that we were completely on the same page about you know 99 of everything and when you have that co-directing is actually like so helpful <laughs> like yeah. you know it's a really big job where you have you know 16 hours a day where a lot of demands are being made of you and a lot of creative decisions to make and i'm i'm actually i would say i'm surprised we don't see it more but i'm unsurprised by the fact that more and more i'm seeing directing duos um you know whether it's the Safdies or the Russos or you know um 
you know, we're, we're the rare directing duo that aren't brothers. Um, <laughs> but, but like you, you do, see, you know, film is such a collaborative medium uh, that to me, it feels totally natural. Um, and to me, and I've directed a lot of stuff solo and that's great. And I'd happily do it again, but for this project and for the other projects that I have planned with Sarah, um, I'm excited for the, for the collaboration to continue. There's something really nice about having, just even having someone to bounce ideas off of or gut checks or, you know, like, um, you know, I, I think we have that with all of our creative collaborators, whether it's our cinematographers or, our, uh, you know, producers, they're all people we trust. Um, but sort of at the director level, it's nice to ha be able to like talk things out um, and to argue and to disagree and, you know, um, it happens, but never, you know, never in any way that was not just like, we're both trying to get this thing right and just have different ideas of how to get there. Um, and I think the actors all, and the and the other crew members on set sort of appreciated it as well because there was one of us was available. Whether it was the actors wanted to talk about something or the cinematographer wanted to go over something technical, one of us was always there to like help. Yeah, because someone always gets ignored on set because the director is busy with something. You know, and the actors might have they might need something, but the director might really need to be with the cinematographer. Um, so, uh, you know, different film sets have different ways of dealing with that. There's acting coaches, there's things like that. Uh, but I think that's the way we did it, it worked really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, speak, you brought up another, uh, interesting, uh, creative decision that I thought of while watching the film. Um, th there's. The cinematography is wonderful in this film. Um, there's color choices. I don't know the technical terms off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but there's like, she's at home with her aunt and uncle and it's very muted color tones. It's very like almost black browns um, and grungy earthy tones there. But then she goes to the school and it's just all of a sudden like somebody turned the light on outside or something like that it's just so I, I want to ask about that um d obviously that was a um creative decision made to support the story so could you just talk a little bit about the cinematography a little bit yeah i mean we always wanted to have a bit of an evolution in the film from um jamie sort of feeling very grounded and feeling like living in, in the very material world um, and this new system that was opening up for her. And whether it's the new system of the Jehovah's Witnesses or the new system of, uh, you know, uh, love that she's chosen, we wanted, especially in the scenes with Jamie and Marika were together for it to open up uh, like that and for, for the sort of like dark, dreary palette of home to be um, something that she was seeing an alternative uh, out of, um, but, you know, but there was always, there's sort of this twist to it because, you know, how real is that? How far is she allowed to go in that? What does she have to sacrifice for that paradise uh, is a question. So we really, you know, I, I'm trying to be a bit vague so I don't give away yeah. too much of the, the story, but we, we really wanted the, the color to tell a story. Um, and, you know, our approach and our, our cinematographer Gail's approach um, that she came up with, which I thought was very smart was, not to oversaturate or you know really blow out the rest of the colors of the film, but rather to sort of like undersaturate the you know the parts that we wanted to be yeah. a little bleaker, and then have it just sort of bloom into full color rather than like really put you know starting at a normal level and then blasting color to sort of feel mm -hmm. like oh life is being breathed back in and the natural like colors of life uh, you know which were very beautiful shooting in Saguenay in fall like you know we didn't have to do much to make that look beautiful. Um, but we wanted it to sort of, um, you know, come out of the come out of the environment and come out of the world that they were living in. Yeah, yeah it reminds me a bit of uh, Coda, a little bit in the cinematography, um, just a little bit. Um, I haven't seen that yet. Oh, you should see it. I definitely should see it. Um, it's on Apple TV Plus if you've got a subscription. I'm sure that I there's, do. I'm sure there's a DVD screener still floating around from Blockbuster yeah. somewhere. Um, it is the best picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I was really grateful for um, because I really loved that film last year. Um, 
but yeah, um, uh, do, do, do. Um, one thing I really appreciated about the Jehovah Witness element of the film um, is I think it can um, apply to, to other religions as well. For example, um, obviously not in the same ways, um, but that feeling, which, uh, let's see, how can I dance around this? Just the feeling Murray has towards the end of the film about the Jehovah's Witness. I've had that feeling too. Um, I was dating um, a girl who was like in this offshoot of Mormonism. She, like, there's this weird thing about it. And like, you, you disagreed with her and it was like, oh no, uh, maybe I shouldn't disagree uh, be because you could feel that the things there was, a, there was a line you couldn't cross kind of thing yeah there was like no you can't have this disagreement uh because this is what we believe um and it's like and it was something small just like a um i had admonished her pastor for like doing a slideshow about all the great mission work he did i was like <laughs> yeah but we should have had a sermon right and she was like no <laughs> but I just wanted to share that anecdote um, really quick. And thank you for that um, because I think it kind of helped me connect more because I think, I, I think maybe sometimes people feel um, that they're, um, that maybe sometimes if, if something is hyper specific, it's not made for them. And I don't think that's true here. You can kind of just, okay, yeah, sure. Maybe I don't have an experience with it, with Jehovah's Witnesses or anything like that. Um, I certainly don't have those experiences, but I did, still did feel like I was able to connect. Uh, even if uh, it you wasn't... Know, I, Go ahead. It, it's a bit of a cliche, but I think the, the specific is always universal. You know, and I think the more the, we, we wanted to get into as many specific details as possible because we knew that, like, ironically, that, that those would be the ones people latched on and understood and be yep. interested in and would create a connection. Um, so I'm glad that you saw that your, yourself, because I think that's exactly what we were trying to do. Yeah, well, um, I'm running out of time here, so I'll just leave you with this. Uh, I want to thank you both uh, for making the film. I think a lot of people, I, I'll be recommending this to, I'm um, talking with a few uh, press friends and I've already recommended it to them. Um, but yeah. Thank I'll you so have, much. Uh, everyone watching the, or listening um, can look for my review on June 13th after, oh no, sorry, June 11th uh, <laughs> after the screening um, at around at 5 30 to 7 o'clock I, I forget exactly what time but june 11th at, at night <laughs> come there and my review will be live mark uh sarah thank you so much thank you thank you and uh